Oppie was my first mentor, the first of three people who really changed, set my course in physics, changed my life in the sense of giving me a sense of direction, a sense of how I wanted to go. Uh, the other two were my thesis advisor, David Ball, who was also, became a very close friend, and John Bardeen with whom I worked for two and a half years as a postdoc following my PhD. Here's what they look like. Uh, the Oppenheimer picture I wanted to show you is one taken by Alfred Eisenstein, which shows it with a hat, a pork pie hat. It's a much more characteristic pose, but this is pretty much what he looked like when I met him in 1946. Here's David Paul. David was an extraordinary scientist whose career was absolutely destroyed by McCarthyism. He had refused to testify before the House on American Activities Committee, refused to testify about his political beliefs, took the Fifth Amendment, and as a result was immediately fired by Princeton University. And not only that, he was not, despite the fact, he was recognized as being one of the three wonderkins of post-war physics. The other two were Richard Feynman and Julian Schwinger. And Princeton had felt when they hired him, they had the answer to Harvard and Cornell. And I think they may have. But because Bohm had, could not get a job in the United States, he went into scientific exile, first to Brazil, then Israel, then England, and he lost touch with experiment, and he lost touch with being surrounded by a group of very bright people continually to try out his ideas out on. So that we lost, I think, a major, he still is a cult figure in physics because he succeeded in making a consistent interpretation of quantum theory, which does not involve quantum theory. But as Feynman pointed out to him, it was not going to ever have any traction because it was rather complicated and it did not predict anything new that made it unique. It's, he simply succeeded by working very hard in being able to get the standard results. Uh, I worked with him not on that, but on the theory of plasma oscillations, which led me into solid state physics, as it was called, and then into what became condensed matter. John Bardeen was another major influence. I was his first postdoc. I shared an office with him for two and a half years. And John reinforced what I would learned from Bohm and what I learned from Oppenheim. Namely, that when thinking about physics, it's not a matter of equations. Physics is concepts, physics is ideas, and physics is above all experiment. So think experiment, experiment, experiment. How can you explain experiment? How can you think about it? And Think about it first, and then start writing down equations to describe what it is you are trying to model. John reinforced that. He also taught me how to work on a really difficult problem, which again was to focus on experiment. And then, once you may have a phenomenological picture of what's going on, then try to make a model, try to incorporate it into a theoretical calculation. But begin with experiment, begin with phenomenology. Uh, during the years 55 to 57, I was teaching at Princeton, and I acquired right away that first fall a marvelous graduate student who had come from France to study with me, Philippe Nozier. He became a marvelous collaborator and a fellow author, as I shall describe, and a very good friend.
through the years. Uh, those were exciting times, the years 55 to 57. Uh, they climaxed with the development of the microscopic theory of superconductivity by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer in Urbana at the University of Illinois. But it also was the time of the growth of a new subfield of physics, the many body problem. The realization that we could think about electrons and metal or nuclei or nuclear matter or liquid helium in very much the same way. We had to look at what were the consequences of the interactions and try to sort out how they gave rise to things like quasi-particles and collective bolts and the like. And it was very useful to try to, as you thought about a problem in electrons, to think about what might have been done in nuclear matter, or even more vice versa. I think what we did in Kinetz matter influenced nuclei and thinking about nuclei and nuclear matter and liquid helium more than the reverse. So I was very much part of my life, the beginning of the mini body problem. You know, as a graduate student, uh, I thought, and all my colleagues did too, in the late 40s, we had missed out by 20 years. We'd missed the glories of the development of quantum mechanics when essentially every theorist around was able to do something exciting and feel they'd been part of something major. Uh, what we didn't realize is that we also had the opportunity to change the world of physics. And the world of physics after the late 40s was very different from the world of quantum mechanics in the 20s. And we were all able to play a role in bringing that about, and the mini body problem was part of that. I, let me go next to frontiers in physics. I'll get back to, to my books in a moment. Uh, a publisher, a very young publisher's representative named Bill Benjamin, representing his own company, appeared in my office in the fall of 1960. Uh, he wanted me to write a text. I said, I couldn't, I'm not interested in writing a text. And uh, explained that you know the standard things that one would write a book about. Uh, a lot of the good books had been written, and I certainly wasn't interested in writing another. On the other hand, I said, what we really need, what the field needs, is something quite different, namely making the lecture notes, which were already around, many of us had making these available to a broad audience. In other words, making it very easy to write a book. Because you could be informal, you didn't have to dot every I and cross every T and worry about your commas. And you could put out something that was sort of state of the art about what were the frontier topics in the field. So that was my idea. Bill Benjamin accepted it and frontiers in the moment that I realized it was probably going to succeed uh, was at a New York meeting in the uh, January of 61 when uh, I was chatting with uh, Dick Feynman and Freeman Dyson and I told them about my idea for this new series and Freeman turned to Dick and said, you've got to be part of this. Uh, Dick agreed on the spot, and so I knew that with Feynman in hand, surely many, many other people would go along. And so uh, that following year, the first volumes, and actually that fall, the first seven volumes of the series appeared. And it will give you a sense of what seemed to me at the time, some of the most important lecture notes around, and uh, some of the most important people writing. And uh, looking back on it, uh, it's, I'm still happy with that choice. 
Frontiers moved forward rather quickly and highly successfully uh, for another four decades, which is a pretty long time for a series to go. Uh, in the 104th volume was published in 2005, and that was the end that marked the end of the series because Frontiers had been sold as publishing companies changed hands. It wound up in the hands of Perseus Books, which handed it off to something called Westview Press, which was interested in keeping it alive, but not interested in helping it grow. So it, it came to a happy end in the sense that about half the books are still in print and can be found. But on the other hand, there are no books appearing under that uh, title. On the other hand, it had its imitators and it had quite a few of these. And so there are still many opportunities for those of you who have lecture notes that you'd like to publish to get them out there. What about the theory of quantum liquids? Uh, Nazir and I kept in close touch, and we decided we might try to write a book together. Uh, so I applied for a leave of absence to go back to Paris. We worked together from 57 to 58, and uh, we, on my application I said I'd like to write a book and I'd also teach at uh, Orsay, so I got a Guggenheim, in fact my second Guggenheim, to go to Paris and work with Nozia. We began the book sitting on the beach in Carchez. If you've not been to Corsica, I strongly recommend Carchez to you. Beautiful old little town of Greek origin, and at the Hotel Talasa, where the Karsha school was first held, uh, we sat on the beach and we planned our work. There's a picture of Nazir. It's a much more recent picture. It's taken about 10 years ago. He still looks very much like that. He looked rather different 40 years ago. So what we tried to do with, with the theory of quantum liquids was to focus, we, had, we thought our audience should be experimentalists. There are a lot more experimentalists out there than theorists. We thought if we could reach experimentalists, we could also then reach theoretical physicists. And we decided to do it well, to not introduce Feynman diagrams because those might scare a certain number of people off. They might not do it today, but in, in 1962 they certainly would have. So we decided to do it without diagrams, just focusing on basic concepts, minimum of equations, and the sort of the minimum formalism that's required to think about many body problems. You need to think about correlation functions, response functions, some rules are very helpful. And our focus was really mainly on what's the physics? What, what does it mean to have a quasi-particle? Uh, a quasi-particle, we know, is the idea of the term introduced by Landau, uh, but, but actually, when I look back on it, introduced by me in my PhD thesis working with David Ball, in which I said, you don't ever think about an electron moving along. It always moves with a cloud of other electrons in such a way that the basic interaction between two electrons is not their bare interaction long range, but rather a short range screened interaction. So that was a quasi-particle before the term was 